Recently, somebody sent me a TikTok featuring biblical scholar Francesca Stavrakopoulou. That's fun to say. This video has definitely been making the rounds, and boy howdy, she was really owning the fundies. In 2016, she made an appearance on The Weekly with Charlie Pickering and expressed her thoughts on the Bible. Now, don't get me wrong, the good doctor comes across as smart, charming, and funny, but here's the thing. It seems like this Bible scholar has a real distaste for the Bible itself. Let's dive in and see what she has to say. We're, gonna, we're just going to talk about the Bible, yeah. and I want to learn more about it. First off, who wrote it and when? Some people think that Moses wrote it, which he didn't, because Moses didn't exist. Look, I know a lot of the cool kids are saying that Moses wasn't real, but let's stop and think about this for just a second. Imagine being part of a group of Jews assigned the task centuries after the events to completely fabricate Moses, compile the Torah, an amazing work of literature, and convince your nation that this fictional story is their true foundation instead of relying on their actual historical memories. Seems pretty challenging. Or picture someone in Hezekiah or Ezra's time smearing lamb's blood on their doorpost and clearing out all traces of leaven from their house. Their neighbor asks, um, Josiah, what are you doing? And Josiah responds, I'm getting ready to celebrate Passover. You know, the time when our people were delivered by frogs, locusts, hail, and passed through the Red Sea. It's all recorded in Moses' law. It's going to be lit. You'd probably be thinking, um, who's Moses? I'm not saying that it's impossible for strange legends to take hold in a nation, but the evidence you provide that Moses or the Exodus didn't happen needs to be better than, well, it's not in the archaeological record. So I went back to the original interview, and that's actually the argument that she makes. Because when you do take a historical approach, so look at the archaeological evidence for events or people described in the Bible, it's very hard to find corroborating evidence to support the biblical claims about the past. So once you start saying, did this actually happen or not? So was Jonah swallowed by a big fish? Obviously, no, he wasn't swallowed by a big fish. Was there an exodus from Egypt? No, there wasn't an exodus. So once you start doing that, then you have to start doubting the credibility of all the other claims that the Bible makes. And that's why people get annoyed, because for some reason, people like to think that the Bible's true. Let's bracket the whole genre of Jonah for just a moment and think about the exodus and archaeology just a little bit more. Out of the 120 ancient Near Eastern kings known to us from various documentary sources, only 20 have their existence confirmed by inscriptions. That means we have 100 missing kings, even though they boasted of victories, or mentioned as defeated by other kings. Consider also the fact that leaders of tribal slave rebellions can slip through the historical cracks. Think about Spartacus, for instance. There is no contemporary evidence supporting his existence, only two historians who wrote about him approximately 150 years later. But despite the lack of evidence, have you ever heard anybody deny that he was a real historical person? And let's not forget that not that long ago, liberal archaeologists and certain Old Testament scholars outright denied the existence of King David. They favored evolutionary theories of Israelite religion that aligned with such conclusions. But guess what? In the early 1990s, they stumbled upon the Tel Dan Steel, which mentioned the House of David dating back to the 9th century. So there was an actual Davidic dynasty in the 9th century. Well, it might be accurate to say that the evidence for the Exodus or Moses is scarce, the evidence for a lot of historical figures around that time is equally scarce. Now you might be saying to yourself, come on Eric, you big, dumb, naive apologist baby. Don't you know that there are other reasons why critical scholars reject the Exodus? Well for that, Inspiring Philosophy has a whole playlist on the Exodus and the historical Moses, and so I'll be sure to link a playlist in the description down below. Okay, so who does she think did write the Bible? So then you have to think, well, who did write it? And it's basically a collection of different um, authors from centuries and centuries. So probably with the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, you're talking about at least 500 years in the making. With the New Testament, you're talking about probably 150 to 200 years in the making. But basically, it was all written by men with daddy issues. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I get that late night TV is all about being funny and edgy and entertaining, but I have to say, this is over the line. Pretty obvious how unfair, biased, and even sexist this comment is. Boiling down the entire Old Testament to the writings of men with daddy issues is not just a lazy generalization, but it completely dismisses the rich variety of content and themes within the text. She has to know better than this. This armchair psychology is not only unhelpful, but also disrespectful to any religious person in the audience who holds the text in high regard. The impression given here is just too binary. Either you're a narrow-minded fundy 
who takes every word of the Bible literally, or you're a truth-seeking scholar like her, dismissing the Bible's claims as mere fabrications by men with daddy issues, is just far too reductionistic. I mean, I at least appreciate her honesty and that she's putting her cards on the table, but for a biblical scholar, I have to say, this isn't such a great look. If you were editing the Bible, what would you take out? Is there anything that you'd New remove? New Testament? Um, no. Um... That's, I mean, that's pretty controversial. Surely not all okay, of the New no, Testament. Okay, okay. Paul. Anything written by St. Paul? Just all of Paul? Yes. That's like taking Paul out of the Beatles. He was pretty important. <laughs> No, because, yeah, because no, really Paul, wrote, Paul wrote a huge amount of the New Testament. Yeah. He is, by and large, the founder of the church. He is the founder of Christianity. So what? Okay, so setting aside the shock factor that if she could, she would remove the entire New Testament out of the Bible, did she really just pull the old canard of Paul was the founder of Christianity? Scholars widely believe that Paul is passing on a creed in 1 Corinthians 15, stating that Jesus died for our sins. He also refers to a tradition when discussing the Eucharist in 1 Corinthians 11, highlighting Jesus' identification as the new Passover lamb. These facts clearly show that Paul isn't making up the concept of the atonement. Let's not forget the resurrection. Paul obviously didn't invent it. In fact, he initially denied it while persecuting the church, only to embrace it later. Some might argue Paul rarely quotes Jesus, and he doesn't reference his life stories. Fair enough, however, he does cite Jesus' teachings on divorce and the Lord's Supper, as I already mentioned, and he emphasizes that his teachings align with those of Peter and the other apostles. Sure, Paul doesn't always give specific examples from Jesus' ministries, but his core values undeniably reflect the influence of Jesus' teachings. Just like Jesus, Paul preached servant leadership. Just like Jesus, Paul emphasized love as the ultimate virtue. Jesus spoke of the forthcoming kingdom of God, and Paul taught that it would fully manifest when Jesus returns in glory. Jesus reached out to sinners, prostitutes, lepers, and outcasts, and Paul extended the good news to the Gentiles. What have you got against he Paul? He goes on and on and <laughs> on. He's so down on humanity. He's just really kind of like, oh, you humans, you're so bad, you're so sinful. And it's like, oh, come on, There's, we're not that bad. Maybe Paul was down on humanity, but I don't think that he was necessarily too off base. I mean, seriously, have you doom scrolled Twitter or TikTok lately? But seriously, here is a reality check. History has shown that everyday people can easily turn a blind eye to injustice. Just think about how the Germans allowed Hitler to wreak havoc with many even turning on their Jewish neighbors. Nazi soldiers justify their actions by saying they were just following orders. It's a harsh truth that ordinary individuals often do nothing in the face of evil or even worse, actively participate in it. Or imagine an experiment where participants were told to administer electric shocks that could potentially be lethal. Shockingly, despite pleas for mercy, most of them continue to follow orders and deliver the shocks. This mind-boggling experiment that I'm referring to is the Milgram experiment, and it exposed the terrifying power of obedience to authority. It revealed how easily regular individuals, just like you and I, can be led to harm others simply because someone in charge told them to do so. This experiment took place just 20 years after the Holocaust. So when Paul said that humanity is seriously messed up, I think he actually had a pretty good point. But Paul didn't just give people bad news. No, he said that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against us. And he gave his entire life, traveling all throughout the Roman Empire, enduring sufferings and beatings and persecutions, just to deliver this news. And he took it joyfully. So seeing Paul as like this giant downer just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. The Hebrew Bible, everyone thinks that the God of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, is the kind of like vengeful, hateful, angry one who's like kicking ass all the time. And that the God of the New Testament is kind of like, oh, I love you. But it's not like that at all. The God of the New Testament, he's gone. He's like not interested at all in humanity. Like he's not really present in the New Testament. It's all about Jesus. I mean, who does she think that the writers of the New Testament think that Jesus is? The whole point of the incarnation is that God becomes flesh and experiences our limitations. He experiences our sufferings, our sorrows, our rejection. He dies in the most painful way imaginable. And he defeats our biggest problem, which is sin and death. So to say that God is absent from the New Testament is just absolutely bizarre. This whole interview to me is why, just because somebody says that they're a biblical scholar, it doesn't mean that I feel like I have to take their opinion that seriously. I get that it's late night TV and we're trying to be edgy and funny, but this interview just comes across as awfully cringeworthy to me.